All right. So today, let's get started with our webinar. I'm really excited about this topic. So using SimTrack and Stealth ISS to secure critical infrastructure. As cyber threats increase in sophistication and frequency, protecting your critical infrastructure has become more important than ever. But how can you ensure that your organization is truly secure? Today's webinar features experts from SimCore and Stealth ISS who will discuss the latest strategies and technologies for securing critical infrastructure. So let's introduce our panelists. Today we have Stealth ISS President Dasha Deckworth, Stealth ISS CEO Robert Davies, SimCore President and CEO Robert Johnson III, as well as SimCore VP of Sales Robert Rodriguez. So a little bit about SimCore. SimCore develops innovative next generation file integrity monitoring software. The SimTrack integrity suite monitors, protects wide range of physical network, cloud and virtual IT assets in real time while providing detailed forensic information about all changes. Securing your infrastructure with SimTrack helps you get compliant and stay that way. And a little bit about Stealth ISS. Stealth ISS is a renowned full-service international MSSP and cybersecurity expert with a wealth of experience. Their expertise lies in staying ahead of evolving threat landscapes and providing cutting-edge strategies and technologies to fortify critical infrastructure. By combining their knowledge as well as an industry-leading solution like Syntrack, they empower organizations to proactively defend against cyber threats and protect their most vital assets. So now I'm going to pass it along to Robert Rodriguez. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks, uh, Robert and Robert and Dasha for, for joining us today. Uh, so like Lauren said, we're going to talk a little bit about critical infrastructure and how to protect it and how Stealth ISS and how Syncore do that and how we can help you do that. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about what is critical infrastructure, because that can have different definitions for different people um, in different parts of the world. So when we talk about critical infrastructure here in the US, we're talking about like the essential systems and the assets uh, that are vital for the functioning of society, basically. In the US, we have 16 different sectors that we consider critical infrastructure. That's things like energy, electric, where I came from, that's my background, uh, transportation, communication, healthcare, and more. And basically these sectors are so important that their disruption would have serious consequences. And uh, that's how the United States uh, defines critical infrastructure, but that's not all we're talking about today, right? We're talking, we are talking about that kind of critical infrastructure, but we're also talking about the critical infrastructure in your environment, the pieces of your network that are so vital that you can't operate without them, whether it's AD or whether it's your your EMS, the electric in the electric world. Uh, what are the pieces of your network that are so vital that they're critical inside there? We're going to be talking about those as well. So so let's get going. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask a couple questions. I have about four or five questions. Um, planned out. And I'm going to ask these to, to our panel, to Robert and Robert and Dasha, and they're going to respond and uh, kind of go back and forth in that kind of format. And we'll go to the next question. Um, one of the things I definitely want everybody in the audience to do is have your own questions as well. Um, we have a chat inside Zoom here. And uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, put them in there. And at the end, we'll ask those as well. So for now, we're going to start with our questions. And the first question I have for everybody in the panel today are, uh, what are what are the most significant threats, cyber threats that we're seeing to critical infrastructure today? So I'll open it up to you guys to talk about that. Oh. I'm happy to make a start. Oh, Dasha, go on, off you go. <laughs> Thanks. So um, I, I think the biggest one, of course, is, um, you know, malicious actor. So um, our, our enemies, countries nation states um that are looking at putting us at risk and we've seen that in the news constantly it's either china russia north korea that um in some way shape or form want to do us harm and uh yeah critical infrastructure uh, it is one of the areas and uh, unfortunately i have not seen any any attacks or anything by accident, or at least not the ones that make the news. Um, there's always this human factor, you know, the employee, the disgruntled employee, the accidental attack because something got fat fingered or 
something happened. But in general, I would say it is really the nation states that uh, that do cause some some biggest threat to us. I agree. Um, I would add um, supply chain attacks uh, are uh, something we need to be cons um, concerned about. I think that this uh, can, have, and in particular, software supply chain attacks. And we're all very familiar with the impact of solar winds and uh, its impact on the government, many of the organizations that were using the Orion product. And most of all, that unknown factor. You know, even though this was, you know, a few years ago now, that was what in 2020, we still don't know the exact impact or ramifications because we don't have visibility into everything that occurred or or were done, everything that was done by those bad actors that Dasha just referred to. So, um, so I think supply chain attacks um, are something we really need to figure out how to address. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just square the circle on this on this question so we've covered ransomware and advanced persistent threats insider threats dasha mentioned um, robert mentioned supply chain there are some emerging threats too so internet of things you know we're all connecting stuff up to our companies do we really know what that looks like um, you know how are we securing those and then lastly i i think certainly within crit the critical infrastructure world as a um, as Robert mentioned, you know, those, those 16 areas that are classified as critical infrastructure, you know, inherent in those organizations, you know, th these are quite fragile systems in operation in those, in those types of companies. And, you know, uh, vulnerabilities in, in software, firmware and, and stuff like that really needs to be kind of managed and, uh, and maintained because we, we see weaknesses in um, you know, lack of patching and, and lack of appropriate awareness when it comes to vulnerabilities. All good answers. Thanks, guys. There, there is a lot to think about. When we, when we talk about what the most significant cyber threats are, you guys all mentioned different things. We talked about enemy countries. We talked about IoT, lack of patching. We talked about supply chain. And those are just a few of the things that we need to worry about. There are tons of significant threats out there. And we as cybersecurity professionals, you know, we have to be on top of everything. We make one mistake, we're opening ourselves up to uh, to an intrusion. So lots of good stuff. Thank you for that, guys. Um, when we talked about the threats, now let's pivot and talk about the attack vectors, how those guys are getting in. Uh, so Robert Davies, you had talked about some of the IoT lack of patching. Do you, you want to uh, go on that a little bit more? I can do. I mean, really... Um, as I say, OT and SCADA systems and, and stuff like that, they're, they're inherently, I guess, I would use the word legacy. So they don't necessarily, or they weren't necessarily built with updates and patching in mind. So, you know, when we as a company go in and we would assess something like that, A, we take those things very seriously and very carefully because they're easy to break. But that's still not to say they cannot be updated and, and cannot be patched. Um, it, it really is a conversation with with the organization on how we go about that, but with the keyword on carefully because this stuff breaks. Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, Mr. Davies is right in that IoT world, and especially in SCADA and process automation control. Many times you have the general philosophy. If it's not broken, don't mess with it. Don't <laughs> fix it. Because um, there's a lot of risk just in performing an upgrade because you can, um, that could result in downtime and affecting operations. So it's not as simple as in some other environments. Um, but your question is about attack vectors. And, you know, it's concerning in those environments because you can try to even air gap those environments, but you still have those terminals, those um, man machine interfaces or user interfaces that folks have access to. So now that becomes the attack vector, not necessarily the PLC, but the gateway to those PLCs and control systems via those uh, front end user interfaces, and, and MMIs, man machine interfaces is what that stands for. So um, yeah, the, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Robert. So yeah, just to just to build on that, you know, remote access, third party vendor attacks. You know, these these SCADA systems or OT systems have 
you know, back in the day had a modem on them that the third party would dial in to support, right? Stuff hasn't really changed very much since then. No. <laughs> so, so this is, you know, this is where the policy angle comes in. Do you have a policy that, that talks directly to your third parties? And I'm probably answering another question, sorry. Um, you know, and manage these folks by policy if, if the technology is inherently inherently weak. You can definitely improve your posture that way. The second half of that question is how do we defend against them? How do we defend against these common attack vectors? You know, you talked a little bit about that. Um, I mean, there's so many out there. We talk about the HMI, we talk about you know the SCADA, the OT. There, there's so many more out there, not just in regular critical infrastructure that's defined by the US. But every organization's critical infrastructure. So, so how do we defend against those when we're in like the non OT environment? I think it it comes down to the basics again. It really doesn't matter if it's OT, IoT, um, I, OT in general. It's it comes back to the fundamentals. You know, make sure you. And I know there's controversy between patch it or configure it properly patching alone i know everybody's preaching it everybody's saying you know if you pre if you patch everything it's going to be all good no it's not there's a lot more to it and it starts with you know disabling standard and default usernames and passwords um starting with creating a design an architectural design with defense with various different defense layers you know it also comes back down to don't put your eggs in one basket you know if you're using one vendor um it's it's a risk because if you have everything your entire infrastructure base let's say on on cisco or juniper um if that device or if the if if that is a threat or there's a zero day, then your entire infrastructure is suddenly compromised or can be compromised. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, of course, whatever it is that you do, however you configure it, monitoring, you got to stay on top of it. And here we're talking not just the regular SIM, what is user behavior, what is being changed, but also what you guys do is file integrity monitoring. You got to be aware of what is being changed you got to have a change management process you got to be aware of what is being done what is it being done in a particular phase for upgrades and what is being changed that shouldn't have been changed and we're not necessarily talking your dlp as in you know documents sensitive information but we're talking here file integrity system files dlls configuration settings all of that stuff that i'm seeing is not really happening a lot. It's, um, yes, you're collecting the logs from the systems, you're collecting the application logs at best, you're looking for security logs, but how many companies are actually monitoring the, the system file changes and how much of that, if they monitor, is actually aligned with adequate change control to monitor what should have been versus what has been done. Even if it's a, even if you have an official change control, and you know, during two o'clock in the morning, um, we will be changing things. But then it comes down to, okay, great, we had a change window, but was that has everything that has been changed? Was it correct? Should have all that been changed? And I think that is usually the biggest issue right there. Is that's, you know, it's hard to do. Not many companies do that, but I think that is really critical to make sure that it's it's being done properly because that can help. If I could just expand on that, Robert, I know you, you want to jump in. So I don't, I don't know um, if I can after that. That was <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see one small but important thing that that maybe Dasha didn't cover up. Yes, it's a multi-layered approach. Yes, it's a comprehensive approach. It's people, process, and technology. And we've kind of covered process and technology, but people, yeah. Employee training and awareness um, is so important. And yet so few companies do it well. I, I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss that out from the, the very exhaustive list that Dasha provided. Right. Every industrial control system, every skater environment, they're different. They're like snowflakes. 
it, it you know you're creating and putting together the just the right set of industrial Internet of Things devices and SCADA systems for that specific process. So there isn't a cookie cutter approach, and that's why both of the techniques that Mr. Davies and 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 Ms. Deckworth have, have brought up are important. You really just have to think, what are the right people, the processes, the techniques? Uh, I think a four big high, a defense in depth strategy is important. I think there are four key things that we need to, to always be thinking about. One, what's on your network? You have to know your inventory. And that's more important in, in these industrial uh, critical infrastructure environments than in typical IT environments, because many times your um, the tools that you use to identify what's in your network will not identify some of those SCADA systems, because they may be on a network or indirectly on a network. Some of these networks don't talk TCP IP. They may talk Data Highway or Data Highway Plus or one of these other uh, protocols. So you can't simply do a network scan and, and think you actually know what's on your network. So um, so I think that's a very critical starting point. And then as Dasha mentioned, um, hardening your systems is, is a very critical piece, especially for those SCADA systems, those HMIs, harden them if you can, and then of course patch your, um, your PLCs or control systems uh, if possible. And then, of course, you need to add a layer, which is that um, you know XDR or antivirus or malware protection layer, or whatever is best for your environment. And then, I think that the final piece, the fourth piece, is is a visibility layer, and that's the piece that Dasha really was drilling into, that you don't hear enough folks really um, put enough effort into, is understanding completely what has changed. Has my configuration file of my of my routers and switches that control my that are routing everything on my uh, industrial control network have that has that changed in some way have those configuration files or those dlls that dasha has mentioned been altered in some way these are things that slip by most other tools but have a material impact on your business and particularly on your critical infrastructure because now we're talking about resulting downtime or even potentially a loss of life. So this is serious business and uh, we need that level of visibility in those types of environments. Exactly, exactly. And you know, I always thought it was funny um, because we would always have change windows and change freezes you know, over holidays. And that's because change is risk. That's the reason we have change windows, change freezes because every change we make is risky to take stuff down. We would want to document every single change we made uh, and do constant testing. So we had you know, a lot of eyes on all those changes, but then there's all these other changes that you guys, like Dasha talked about and Robert talked about that happened in the background to databases and firewalls and routers and DLLs. And nobody, they're like Bruno. We don't talk about those. We don't talk about those changes. We don't, um, but we, uh, there's a lot that happens out there that are vectors for attack that we need to, to be looking at that. And uh, you guys talked about, you know, knowing the environment. Those are the, the CIS critical controls. Number one is know your hardware. Number two, know your software. And it's not fun. It's not sexy, but it needs to be done. You know, everybody wants to configure the, you know, the cool palo. Everybody wants to start working with the source stuff. But we need to do the basics, like Doc just said. That's how we make sure that those attack vectors aren't out there. Um, so thank you for that, guys. Uh, there are a lot of attack vectors. There are a lot of different attacks. Every time you turn on the news or you read about something, there's different attacks out there. So that's the next question is, how does a person, how does an organization stay updated on those latest threats and vulnerabilities that are out there? How, how do we do that? Reading, making sure, paying attention, getting, um, I mean, honestly, it's it, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, I think one of the great greatest things that we have is the different tools that have different feeds in here, you know, that provides you with um, security feeds, information, for example, SIM, but it's more, more on the technical side, um, firewalls, network devices, you know, they got um, IDS feeds, they got signature feeds, they got all of these things that will catch a lot of these things, but I think 
one of the key areas is the security team needs to have a, even if it's just a Google newsletter or a watch out there to get exposed to everything out there. Um, it's just paying attention to it. It's uh, There's so many zero day attacks. There's so many vulnerabilities being discovered across various different hardware devices, software, network pieces. And if you're not paying attention to it, if you're just focused on, yeah, I'm going to rely on my vendor or I'm going to rely on the next patch, I think you're missing a big point because not everything is going to be covered by the next patch. Or if it will, it's probably late. Um, there's so many zero day things that just cannot be addressed immediately. I mean, who was it uh, just alone this week? Um, one big major network company recalled some of their devices because there is a zero day and it just cannot be fixed. It completely huge compromise. Now, if you have that technology, the vendor will probably notify you. But, you know, if um, if you don't even subscribe to the vendor information, not paying attention to what comes from the vendor, you're going to miss out on that completely. Yeah, I think um, absolutely right, Dash. I mean, sharing is caring. So there is a wealth of information out there. You just need to go ask to join it. I mean, even something relatively simple like the Hacker News, on which is on all, on all um, social media outlets, will give you a running commentary of the latest events happening in kind of hacker world. You know, news sources, blogs, uh, peer networks, um, vendor notifications, as Dasha mentioned, security advisories, you know, information sharing networks, all of that stuff. Um, but also, you know, regularly perform your own assessments, you know, do your penetration testing and your vulnerability assessments and be be aware of your your organization's assets and, and how they are uh, at, at any given point in time. So that's all I wanted to add. Robert, I think you're on mute. So. I think you're muted, Rob. Well, those are great answers. I think I... I have to parse what you what your question a little bit more. You you mentioned how do we keep up with threats and vulnerabilities, and I think I'm going to split those. I think that it's critically important to stay on top of all of these vulnerabilities. You need especially the ones related to your infrastructure, so that you can make the appropriate changes, um, up you know do any patches or mitigate any um, the impact of any of these vulnerabilities. So that's I think that's a critical piece. Um, and I think Dasha and Robert covered that pretty well. But the other part of your question gives me pause, threats. We have 1 million new variants of malware being created a day. It's almost to a point where being notified or the concept of staying updated on threats, as your question poses, seems almost impossible. We just can't digest that level of information in order to make it useful. Um, so again, that kind of makes me really adopt the philosophy that Dasha mentioned. When you have that onslaught of, of challenges and threats, it becomes very important to have visibility into what's happening in your organization, um, because that will transcend those million numeric variants of malware a day, and let you focus on the things that are really relevant, important, and to change and have changed in your own infrastructure. So just a quick follow-on question for each of you guys. I'm just, I'm just curious. Um, Dasha at the very beginning mentioned, you know, we have to read. One of the things we have to do is do our research. And, and so do you guys have a favorite website or a subscription service, something that you use to try to stay on top of things? I'm just curious. Everything. I mean, I've, um, <laughs> to be honest, uh, I think Rob mentioned it already. Hacker News, uh, CIS, um, any any of the big um, you know big vendors, everything that is um, consolidated. And honestly, Hacker News is pretty good one because they update constantly. Yeah. But then there's also um, some. I mean, that comes in every few minutes. Whenever they have something, they post it, which is great. Uh, but then there are several outlets um, where you can 
get a little bit more deeper on particular areas where it's not just news, but really um, insights to give you a better understanding. It's like, okay, here's a threat, but here's how it happened. Here's why it happens. So for example, um, crabs on security, um, that is a good one. Schneier as well. I mean, you've got all these experts out there that actually put the time and effort in to create nice in-depth articles to explain how this happened, why this is happening, um, and kind of focusing more on just, okay, here's a vulnerability, but what it means to you, how businesses are struggling with it. And I think a combination between a technical news outlet and then more explanation around it on the impact, how they got in, what impact it had on the business. I think a combination of those two are really critical for any security professional to get the, the big picture around it and, and extrapolate from there what impact it could have on them um, because it's not always that straightforward and clear. Yeah, I, I would absolutely support that, of course. But, you know, if you wanted to scare yourself and see where the, where the trends are going, then, you know, there are kind of retrospective reports, you know, Ponemon Institute is a famous one. The Verizon report is, a, is another famous one. You can get a feel for, for trends and, and where this is going. And as I say, be prepared to be scared because it's just getting worse year on year. Yeah. You, you know, the source that has really evolved into something interesting to me lately is are the CISA updates, the CISA advisories. I, Boy, in the last couple of years, that has really become a, a very valuable resource. They've really improved and, and, and co converted those advisories into a real valuable source of information. So now that has evolved to probably be one of my favorite sources of info. Yeah, I see it. I mean, DHS, FBI, you know, they're, they're all doing their, their uh, part in disseminating information in this in this context as well so yeah and they're all yeah. on social media that's the great one of the few benefits that i see of social media is staying mm -hmm. involved absolutely yeah i have a reddit profile that is just for cyber security I'm, I'm subscribed to a bunch of really pertinent reddit on there subreddits and uh that's i get a lot of really good news a lot of quick news out of there so i like that a lot but yeah social media is a great place to do that um but pivoting back to um, to our, our original topic um, about critical infrastructure. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So like I said in the beginning, I, I came from an energy background. I worked for an electric utility. So I dealt a lot with NERCSIP. And if anybody here has dealt with NERCSIP, first of all, I'm sorry. Um, it's not fun. Um, it's very, very prescriptive in what it does. Um, one of the things that I had to do, and I want to talk about here and get your guys' opinion. One of the things I had to do is looking at what NERCSIP forced me to do, and if you're not dealing with NERCSIP, these are still good practices. One of the things it forced me to do was put in file monitoring, file integrity monitoring. So this was probably 10 years ago now that I did this, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but so th that leads to my question. So let's talk about monitoring. We talked about changes and changes are risky. We talked about all the different things in the environment. So how does that real-time monitoring of the environment help an organization stay ahead of those cyber, cyber threats? And here, I'd like to start with Robert Johnson. Well, um, I think it helps you stay ahead of those threats because it helps you fill the gaps um, in your other in the other parts of your strategy. I mean, the one thing, especially in on the current topic, critical infrastructure, there's one thing we know for sure for control systems, data systems, um, energy systems is that they don't randomly change. These systems are, this, are just due to reliability and reducing risk. They're in the same state until there's an authorized change window. And then that's when updates occur, and then they stay in the current, in a new steady state. Because of that, file integrity monitoring, or even the bigger concept of system integrity monitoring, monitoring your databases and Active Directory and all these other components, that, that drive that environment is, is critical and it becomes a very effective way of understanding if something unexpected has occurred in your environment. And Mr. Rodriguez is not always just a hacker. You know, 
90% of all our network outages are just due to human error, even in critical infrastructure environments. How do you understand what has occurred? Um, so whether it's hackers or human, well, hackers are humans, whether it's bad actors or good actors that didn't quite follow the rules. <laughs> um, those, those are two um, categories that uh, file integrity monitoring can help identify and was probably the reason you, you had to implement that as part of or except uh, probably section 10 is what you're referring to. Yes, I mean, that perfect answer. You know, for us, it's about early threat detection. And I covered that. It's about, okay, something's happened. How are you going to respond to that? What is your, you know, are you going to deliver against your incident response plan? Um, you can get threat proactive with some threat hunting also but for us it's it's we i mean we, we totally reveal what you guys do you know that um we we bring in the behavioral analysis component to it as well so it's kind of network behavior endpoint behavior user behavior and we can i, I think that's the new frontier when it comes to kind of mdr xdr you know it's it's no longer oh we found something let's go fix it now it's oh this endpoint is beaconing out to Beijing at 2, 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. That's not usual. With, with the ability to run a playbook to say, oh, if you see something like this, then you can either quarantine it or switch the device off or capture the logs or, or whatever it is that you want to do. So monitoring is how we're, we're staying ahead of the ever-evolving um, threat, if you like, certainly from a behavior perspective. And, and another thing is also what uh, what can happen is accidental user changes. Uh, you know, we're all humans. It happens. Um, but if you don't catch it or don't see it, you know, even just regular during regular change uh, window, sometimes you may just make a change that is going to have a huge impact. It might have been accidentally. You may not... You, you may not even see what the risk is. And I think this is where the tools like file integrity monitoring or even the SIM um, just help see that. You know, a simple configuration change might suddenly open up a huge risk. And if you don't have the tools to, to monitor that, to warn you, to correlate what does this, what this action or the change of this file what action or what what risk is it suddenly now exposing you to in the whole scheme of things? Not necessarily just on that particular system, but the big picture. You know, then if you if you're not paying attention to that, really, it's it's it becomes a problem, and especially around NERC SIP. I mean, we've got this is really that's why why we're here. It's critical infrastructure. We're not talking here the small business. You know, okay, we're gonna have a risk. It's it's a standalone small business, mom and pop shop. Okay, I get ransomware. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a problem. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But here we're talking critical infrastructure. Here we're talking um, intellectual property. I've done I've done incident response and security for oil and gas. You know, here it's not necessarily just also are we going to get our oil in are we going to get the the underlying you know are we going to get the supply are we going to have what we need but also the drilling pieces the logistics around it the how is it being traded you know the volume of it what impact is it going to have on the company itself that does not protect their drilling data for example um that is probably most valuable information rather than just the oil or the gas because that tells you where to go where to drill where the where the gold pot is so it's it's really the whole picture you have to look at and going back to what is the critical data for the particular business or the industry that you need to protect and it's sometimes yeah. it's not the most obvious it's not necessarily the technology, it's the data behind it as well. Yeah. And the there was quite a famous story. Sorry, go on, Karen. 
<laughs> no, I just wanted <laughs> to say, and the third party connections, you know, the contractors that come in, the the AC that is tied into your infrastructure, you can suddenly manage from your phone that is connected into the big picture. I think that is also key. Yeah, that, there was quite a famous story about a, a drilling, a US drilling company being undercut by $1 on an international contract because uh, some other country had, had uh, found their geolocation data, but also their pricing data. So kind of industrial espionage is a, is a thing. I just wanted to give a shout out to the SimTrack product at this point, because we're talking prevention even if you're a system administrator, you uh, you can configure the system so that changes are not allowed. <laughs> and I, you guys are probably going to get into this, and it's not a sales pitch, but you know these. This is one of the many reasons why we 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 love your product because we can protect it. Even we we can protect companies even from the accidental slash nefarious insider threat. I think it's fabulous. So sorry, over to you guys. That was great. Um, Dasha mentioned um, SIMs, and uh, you know, in that environment, Mr. Rodriguez, a SIM is is a key part of the NERC SIP um, strategy and required. Um, but at this point, if you talk to the folks that have to actually use it, they're getting so much information now. It, just the onslaught of alerts is is overwhelming. And what was supposed to be that amazing um, single um, single pane of glass has now emerged to become this single glass of pain. <laughs> 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 so, but you know, I think that it, system integrity monitoring or file integrity monitoring it can help with that to an extent because one thing we know is that. If something has changed and it shouldn't have changed, as Dasha mentioned, correlation analysis, that becomes one of the most significant variables in your correlation analysis. So now you have a starting point for your analysis. Just to put it another way, if you're getting, you know, the average amount of alerts per day is like 4,000 alerts per day, where do you start? But if you did receive a, a, a notification from an integrity monitoring tool that something happened at 2 a.m., well, out of that you know, 4,000 alerts, you have a starting point. Well, now let's look from 1.30 a.m. to 2.30 a.m., that hour window now, and get and have more of a 360 view of what's occurred during that time and go, and go deeper into the analysis. So having a starting point, um, when looking at that needle of a haystack of, of alerts, I think for your for the folks in your security operations center can be just invaluable and help them keep their own sanity to an extent. So it sounds like real-time monitoring is definitely a way that we use to stay ahead of cyber threats. Um, I always thought about it this way. You know, I talked a little bit about the CIS, the SANS critical controls. The first two are know your hardware, know your software. It's all about visibility. Everything they talk about is, you know, you can't protect what you don't know. Um, so it's knowing your environment, it's that visibility into your hardware, your software, and what's changing in your environment. You know, if you have a nice baseline and you say, this is safe, how are we making sure nothing's changing and no one's changing that? Yeah. Um, and that's where that monitoring comes in and helps. That's where that, that film capability comes in and helps. So great answer there. Thank you guys. Um, but let's build on that a little bit more. Um, you know, a film, knowing our, our hardware, knowing the changes that we have by, by implementing voluntary monitoring are some great practices. What are some of the other best practices for improving our posture, our cybersecurity posture in, in, uh, in critical infrastructure? What are some of those best practices that you guys like to see or have seen in the past? I'll start that at a headline level and I'm sure we've got so much detail. So for any, any journey, if you have an idea what your destination is, you still need to understand your starting position. So for me, this starts with understanding that. So, you know, have a risk assessment, have, a, have an assessment of where you're at, and then use that to build upon a strategy of, of projects to then improve that posture. So I, I've set up the answer, but I think uh, who wants to jump in? Well, I'll, I'll, I have a feeling Dash is gonna nail this. So I'm just gonna jump in in, in the middle here. Um, 
is that when it comes to strategy, I think you may have to think about your strategy a little bit differently in, in these critical infrastructure environments. Typically, and we all know the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Well, in the industrial world, in critical infrastructure, it's flipped. Top priority, availability. Then integrity, then confidentiality is this last. So the whole model is flipped. So it also changes your strategy to an extent. So I would like to point out in the middle of both is integrity. It's right, that, right there in the center. Um, so with that, I think I've set it up for Dasha because I know strategy is it's right down our wheelhouse. <laughs> well, strategy is important, 100%. But I, I would like to, especially around critical infrastructure, just go back and and take a look at from from the technology side. I mean, we're talking here a lot of SCADA systems, OT. And I think Rob mentioned it at the beginning. It's been around for a while. We're looking here at legacy system. We're looking here at um, stuff that 20, 30 years ago, maybe even longer, has been implemented. And back then it was, you know, it was there, it was all good. It was not really that important or it did not really have the exposure to the internet and external threats as it has today, because now we've grown into this complex interconnected um, world where people are working remote. People are accessing systems, not necessarily from home, but they are sitting in different offices. So the, the communication and the access from remote has been provided to the systems, which is great, makes it easier to manage. But at the same time, we're suddenly exposing these legacy systems, even though we're trying to patch them, even though we're trying to configure them correctly, they're just old, they're legacy. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things is really as companies starting to realize that, okay, we're at the point where we need to upgrade or we're planning to get new systems in because stuff has changed or we're building new areas of critical infrastructure. I think it comes back down to let's find the right plan. And that goes back to, uh, to you, Rob, is let's create a strategy to focus on what is most critical. And in this case is the integrity and is the availability, but don't forget the rest. So the, creating the infrastructure, creating the way going forward, and especially now as we're starting to get into this whole automation, AI, smart cities, sharing data across different areas with different commercial entities, with different um, government entities, you're suddenly exposing all this data to, I mean, data is information. Information is knowledge and knowledge can be risk. Um, you know, you, you got to keep this uh, keep this secure, secure. So I think this, the biggest strategy is really if you are upgrading something or if you're implementing something, don't go just by technology and buy tools that the vendor tells you it's going to fix the problem. Technology doesn't fix a problem. You gotta go into the biggest threat and the biggest threat or the biggest risk is the human factor. It's us. If you do not inform us, train us, um, we're, not, we're not gonna do the right things. And all of these threats are changing. I mean, there's a huge um, notification yesterday that came out, all these um, phishing emails more sophisticated where you suddenly get access, authenticate against mailboxes um, and pretend to be somebody. And it's not that a password was hacked, it's just a user was asked to do something that looked legit and they put in the username and password and now suddenly you got emails going all over the place but they're legit because they're coming from Microsoft 365 account. So it goes back to the human, the human, if the human is not properly trained, not aware of what is out there, then you're exposing yourself to the biggest risk. So it's, it goes back to what uh, Rob Davis was saying earlier, people process technology. 
it's it, that, that 360 degree right here has to fit together. It has to be go hand in hand. Otherwise, whatever you do on the technology side is not going to work. Whatever you do also on the human side, even the awareness training, if your technology or network architecture design is not good enough, it's not going to be, it's not going to help much. All good advice. I wish I had people like you around 20 years ago when I started my career. My <laughs> life would have been so much easier. Well, so you, you know, you, you know what's a bit frustrating? We've been in this industry, we've been teaching this for so many years. I mean, decades at this point. Change your password, default accounts, remove those, get user awareness training, keep up with all of the patching, you know, create a secure design. We've been doing this, but it's frustrating to see how many companies are just not doing it. And us working a lot on the incident response side, we always have to go back and then do the analysis. Why did it happen? How can this be prevented? And honestly, none of the incident incidents or the breaches that I have seen in the last, let's say, two or three years, I could say, you know what? This was really revolutionary. This was really something we've never seen before. Yes, maybe the attack vector, but the underlying vulnerability, why it was able to happen is usually because configuration, patching, passwords, default accounts, all of the stuff that, you know, we've been talking about for decades. Uh, it's just to add to that frustration. So, you know, we, we have companies say, oh, well, it's too expensive to, to be proactive with cyber. Just some back of the back of a cigarette packet math, you know, at a minimum, your cost of breach is going to be 20x the cost of prevention at a minimum. So I, my fervent wish is that CFOs around the world would recognize that and actually, you, you know, we all have to pay for, for cyber insurance. Well, I think it's a sense of another point. Being proactive with your security posture and looking at industry best practice and, and strategy and planning will actually bring your insurance premiums down. All good stuff. So that's the discussion part of uh, of our webinar. We had a couple of questions come in from the audience, and I know we're we're, we're running short on time. So Robert, Robert, and Dasha, are you guys are you guys uh, okay to stay a couple more minutes to answer a couple of questions? Sure. Sure. All right. All right. So the first question is, what are some key considerations for organizations when selecting a cybersecurity partner like Stealth ISS to protect their critical infrastructure? So Robert and Dasha, I'm going to throw that one at you guys. Okay. I, I think, you know, first of all, you need to identify first what it is that you're trying to achieve. If you don't know it, get a partner that can guide you based on your business, based on your requirements, based on your business operations. Um, getting somebody in that will sell you boxes of hardware, we've talked about it, it's not about technology. Technology will not solve the problem. So you gotta have a strategic partner that will focus on your business, your skill sets, your existing technology, Rip and replace is also not going to work. It's um, you you know it it has to fit into your business, your industry, meeting those requirements. And also, you have to you have to have the trust. And in order to have the trust, you need to also trust and verify. You know what are the processes that the vendor has? How are they addressing their security? Are they just selling services or are they actually living with it as well? Are they implementing it themselves? Are they taking your entire environment, including the connection and the risk that they're bringing to the table? How are they addressing it? You know, all of those things is making sure that you fully understand who you bring in bed with you because you are literally bringing somebody and exposing your critical the most critical information with you. you there's got to be trust and you got to be able to know and trust them that they're going to advise you on the most important thing that is important for your business and the stuff that 
they will deliver is being done at the best possible level, that they will have the proactive security in mind, not the reactive, because that's what you as a business need to have. Yeah, perfect. I think, yes, research the market, have a beauty parade, you know, interview companies, um, you know, check which ones have your best interests at heart. You know, we, we see in the market, cybersecurity is this kind of really sexy thing and companies are adding cybersecurity as a capability to their websites and, and expecting that to generate business. Well, for most of those companies, cybersecurity in, in air quotes is just a technology problem to solve for. It's not. It's governance, risk, compliance, people, process, and technology. So technology for us is actually the, the smallest component of what we do. So any, anyone can sell you a, an MDR, XDR, and, and profess that it's going to do wonderful things for you, and it probably will. Um, but is that company necessarily specialist in working with you to identify your risks and actually put your hard-earned dollars in the right place relative to your operational context? I think that's that's where you you, you need to think about that and and understand that that's that could save you money <laughs> versus a smaller company with uh, you know just just offering you some um, some services so you know for us past performance i would say this we've been going over 20 years as, as dasha mentioned you know we're multi-vertical international all, all of these things you know find a company that checks the boxes relative to you you know i, I would caution against going for a gen generic solution you know, we'll we'll gladly chat with you for hours for free if you if you wanted to get a better point of view on that. Um, but yeah, ed, you know, education is is key. Research the market, do your due diligence, and then yeah, you don't have to choose one straight away. Just uh, in, interview a few. Definitely an important choice we need to make when we're in that position because that that makes or breaks you. Um, good, good. Thank you. What a other questions that came in, this one's for uh, Robert Johnson. This came in when, when Robert Davies said I had to give you uh, some props for SimTrack. So uh, this says, Robert Johnson, can you explain how SimTrack differentiates between authorized and unauthorized changes and how does it take action on that detection? Well, um, we do it by integrating into your existing change management and change control process. See, SimTrack kind of wraps around or actually adds a validation layer to those change control processes that you probably already have in place. And because we're, we're part of a process, that means that we work with you, to, our software actually, our platform can establish an authoritative baseline of how your systems look. And, um, and when it deviates outside of the authoritative baseline using our software, we'll let you know about it in a variety of different ways. Um, and we'll detect it right away in real time, most of the time. And then our software has the ability to do a few things. One, completely block it, like Mr. Davies mentioned. Or it can roll it back, so you don't want to block it. But you, fine, our software can roll it right back to how it was. Or in certain cases, you may just want to log it, maintain an audit trail of everything that occurred. So we let you pick and select different modes of operation based on different sections of that system. It might be for, for this directory, we want to block everything. For this other directory on the system, you want to automatically restore or just log. You have complete control over it all. But oftentimes, and even in this presentation, we use the word file integrity monitoring quite a bit. And that is just one piece of what we monitor with, with the product SimTrack and let you know when it deviates from that authoritative baseline. So yes, files is one critical one, but also registry, users, Active Directory. What if a new user is added to Active Directory? Or what if administrative privileges was granted to a user, maybe even um, just during a change window? You need help, you granted administrative privileges to, to one of your other engineers, and you forgot to remove it. How do you keep track that that actually occurred? Um, databases, 
you know, databases have a lot more than data in them. That's just one piece, but you have your schemas. Believe it or not, databases also have users in them. Um, and those users have different privileges. How do you understand what's changed there? Um, SCADA systems and HMIs, you know, they have their tag databases. These tag databases actually don't change very often when you're first adding a new, I, when you, whether you're adding IO uh, to those tag databases or those SCADA systems, whether it's Wonderware or Intelution or GE, or whatever you might be using, those don't change very often. So that's a great way to monitor your SCADA systems for unexpected changes. Um, so really, we look at integrity beyond just files to all the critical components in your infrastructure, whether it's firewalls, routers, not just Windows, but Windows, Linux, Solaris, Mac OS X, AIX, Mac OS X, FreeBSD, cloud infrastructures. We're all moving toward containers. You know, how do you know? That, oh, this is just a, probably a topic of a whole nother webinar, but this I'm going to throw it out because it's a big concern of mine. Um, containers are great, and we often look at them as throwaways. So many times, because people think, oh, it's a container, I can stand it up, I can tear it down. It may run for an hour, and then you tear it down. So who cares if it's been hacked? Well, the, the issue is that it could be hacked during that hour that that container ran, and without the proper amount of visibility, when that container's torn down, not only is the container gone, but all the evidence, everything that occurred during the time that that container was running. Um, so you need an audit trail of what's happened while those containers, even though you may look at them as throwaway, while they were running, because lots can happen during that time. So um, that level of visibility across the infrastructure, cloud or on-prem, is and understanding exactly what's authorized and what's not is, is how we can really add value. That's a lot to unpack in that one question there. I, I do think we're going to have to get together for another webinar eventually and talk about that. Um, but thank you for that, Rob. Um, last question that we have, unless any others come in. Um, and I, I don't have a good answer for this one, so I'm going to throw it out to you guys. It's an interesting one. It says, this looks like it covers a lot of the cyber realm. But what about the physical security of my critical assets? That's a good one. Yeah, that, that's an attack vector we did not discuss. So, I mean, folks think physical security, they think guards with guns, and, and, and that's clearly an element, and, and fences. Where we are going with this, um, we, uh, and critical infrastructure is a, is a prime use case, we, we scan the facility um, using drones and LIDAR and, and those types of things. We, we render a digital twin. So you think, so what? I mean, we've got a plan of the building. Well, the so what is with the digital twin, we can identify points of weakness that you wouldn't otherwise find on a plan. But more importantly, we, we can run some scenario analysis in the event of an emergency. So say there's a fire in building A, what would you do? So that, this enables companies to get very proactive with their, their kind of emergency planning. And then we, we also have a reactive capability, which if you if you thought of the use case of a of a school with an active shooter um, we have the capability to track the shooter identify where the innocents are get them to safety lock the doors behind them and give law enforcement a single pane of glass to be able to track the perpetrator and then if needs be we can send a drone in to disable that person so you know physical security is as multifaceted as was digital security, uh, just that it's a whole nother conversation. So we'd be delighted to have another webinar on that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, that's I have no idea there. Um, I think we're definitely going to have to get together again and, and talk more. But um, that's all the questions. No other ones came in. Uh, guys, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, Dasha, Robert Davies, Robert Johnson, thank you so much. I know you're busy. Appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, for everyone in the audience, we, you know, we talked about a lot of important things today. We talked about cyber threats. We talked about some of the different attack vectors that are out there, how to mitigate those. We talked about how we stay updated on what's going on out there. We talked a little bit about real-time monitoring and some of the best practices out there. Um, we didn't give enough time to any of those. We could talk so much longer. Uh, so if you have questions, 
if you want to reach out to talk to any of the people on this call, uh, this slide right here is where you would reach out. Here's our websites, phone numbers, and some emails. So we'd love to hear from everybody. Um, we hope that you enjoy this webinar. We're looking forward to doing another one with you guys. And stay safe out there. Thank you, everybody.